Welcome to lesson three, the biology of distress. So there's kind of three sections to this talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna talk about the role of carbon dioxide in the blood is surprisingly important slash critical to the whole thing. If we just spoke about that, we'd probably get most of it done, mm -hmm. all right? We're gonna talk about the nervous system and its role. Mm -hmm. And we're also gonna to touch on medications at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on meds because they're not the ideal solution to distress. They're gonna get their own talk. Okay. And their own course. Okay. In, in due course. In due course. All right, okay, so here we go. All right, now there's, there's a few, I'm, gonna, I'm sort of breaking this down with these essential concepts that I want you to kind of integrate, all right? So if you're taking notes, make sure you note what they are, all right? So the first one is carbon dioxide depletion affects brain function and emotions. How do we know this? Okay, we've all had, well, most of us had the experience of going to a children's birthday party or setting one up, I should say, and you blow up the balloons, mm -hmm. okay? What happens if you blow up the balloons too quickly? We get lightheaded. You get lightheaded. Okay, the reason you're getting lightheaded is we've got various gases dissolved in our blood. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of those is carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you breathe too quickly, you actually are getting rid of more carbon dioxide than you're producing. So you have a deficit of carbon dioxide and that's what makes you lightheaded. Mm -hmm. All right, your brain's not functioning properly. Okay, so carbon dioxide actually regulates the acidity of the blood. So the pH. The pH. Yep. The pH, yeah. Okay. So the longer you are huffing and puffing into a balloon or blowing up a stand-up paddleboard or what have you, okay, the more we're depleting our carbon dioxide and the more lightheaded we feel. Okay, so is this big exhale, little inhale, big exhale, because yeah. you're pushing yeah. more out than you're taking yeah. in. I didn't mean yeah. it to be that, but it what? is, yeah. <laughs> well done you, doctor. <laughs> okay. So that's exactly right. So there we are lightheaded and that's the chemistry of why. All right. So now, it's a bit of a, you just sort of got to wrap your head around this concept. So we've got carbon dioxide dissolved in our blood. Everyone kind of thinks the carbon dioxide, you want, don't want it. Like, get it out, get it, get it out. But you do want some to maintain this acidity. Yeah. All right, so the normal situation, there it is. You start blowing up the balloon. Now all the carbon dioxide is in the balloon, okay, instead yeah. of in your blood. And there you are. Impaired, impaired brain functioning essentially is what's going on. So you can't think straight. You try and solve some complicated thing when you're like this, you just can't do it. Your brain can't do it. Yeah. All right. It, that can vary from mild, which is mostly what people experience because they get this mildly and they stop doing yeah. it. But if you were to continue to do it, you'd actually get delirious. Okay. Okay. All right. So there it is. That's the first concept. All right. When that happens, our emotions tend to be exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Our thinking's impaired and it impacts our judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay. The technical medical term for this state is respiratory alkalosis. Okay, okay. and alkalosis referring to the blood becoming more to alkaline, alkaline. Yeah, for, because... for respiratory reasons. So yeah. you, can, you can have alkaline blood or acidic blood for all kinds of reasons, but this is for the respiratory okay. reason. Okay, yep, good. All right, so there we are, low CO2. All right. Next concept. Okay, this represents a muscle. When I had this on the slide as I was working on it, my son's like, that's a strange looking COVID mask. <laughs> <laughs> But that's a muscle, okay? So what is so in order to you know fight for your life or run for your life, what do you need? You need oxygen and you need fuels, okay? So the muscles mm -hmm. need those, okay? A nerve supply, obviously, mm -hmm. okay? And as the muscles operate, obviously they give off heat because you get hot and, yeah. you, and you sweat. They give off various waste, including carbon dioxide gas, okay, dissolved in the blood. All right, so that's what muscles produce. The more your muscle is operating, the more CO2 it's producing. And yeah. that's why if you go for a run, you huff and puff. The huffing and puffing is to get oxygen in, but critically it's to get carbon dioxide out. Okay, because you've got, okay, so oxygen in needs CO2 out, but also you've got this extra CO2 being produced by the muscles, which is why there's an extra need to exhale. Yes. Because you've got to get the breath out, but you've also kind of got to get the muscle, I know that's low resolution. Yeah. You've got to get the muscle CO2 out as well as the breath the, CO2 the out. The surplus CO2 yeah, out. Right. Yeah, right, okay, okay, yeah, yeah good. Okay. All right, what's next concept? So this thing called the fight and flight response. So I, I, I always sort of assume everyone's familiar with the fight and flight response, but not necessarily, okay? So the fight and flight response is, imagine there is some danger. There is some, mm -hmm. you know, some, some serious danger right there, okay? That, that's threatening me, yeah. okay? I ah, respond, okay? And then chances are I'm gonna do one of these two things. I'm yeah. either gonna fight the threat, if it's a fightable threat, yeah. okay? Or I'm gonna get the hell out of there, yeah. okay? They're my two options. Okay, I don't want to talk about the freeze response because it's not germane to this. But, yeah. So there is a sort of third option, but that's not relevant to, to what we're talking about today. All right, so a little bit more detail. Okay, so that's the basis of this. 
Now we need to understand the detail. So in terms of what the threat is, the threat could be all kinds of things. It could be a real threat. There's a real threat to my life going on. Okay? Snake on the ground in front of you. Something, yeah. yeah. Okay. It could be an emotional trigger. It's something that, it's not like a threat to my life, but it's freaking me out nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It could be some sort of instinct I'm having to, like, I think that's dangerous or I think there's something sus going on here and it's getting me annoyed. Yeah. Okay. I might have misread the situation. Okay, misperception. Or I might be really hypersensitive. So the threat mightn't be all that big, but because I'm really hypersensitive, it, it does activate yeah, me. Yeah, okay. All right, now, what does activate mean? So uh, th this is a representation of our central nervous system. All right. The, when the brain gets this alarm, kind of decides that there's an alarm going on, it does a bunch of things, okay? There's part of our nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. It's not very... It's sympathetic because it's, it's showing sympathy to the muscles that need to do the work, Okay. Sure. So that's where the sympathy lies, right? So that activates, and what that causes is our breathing rate goes up, our airways get um, more dilated, so more air can come in and out. The vessels get more dilated as well in the, in the lungs. Uh, the heart starts beating more quickly, so it's sort of pumping this sort of river of blood to the lungs, and we start secreting adrenaline, which gets everything moving as well, all right? So that's what happens. Oh, we start sweating too. Why? More oxygen in and more fuel to the muscles. Get rid of the CO2 and get rid of the heat. That's why it always happens. Yeah, okay. Okay. Now, to the serve the purpose of running for your life. Yeah. Yes. All right. So it's, it's, it's a normal thing for some kind of threat to impel this emotion. Okay, so we get this big kind of emotional surge of fear or whatever, which gets us activated. And then we enact this action. Okay, our muscles start working like crazy. We're running or we're fighting. And... Um, we're producing lots of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're madly breathing and we're running for our life. And that's fine, okay? Eventually, we, we get away. Well, we don't, but we get away, okay? So the threat is ameliorated. Yeah. Uh, carbon dioxide is normal and that fear or whatever that the emotion is, is discharged. So we're back to a sort of uh, normalized state, shall we say. Yeah, so we get, okay, so danger, do something about it, everything settles down, back to homeostasis. That's how the system was designed to work. Yes, yes. or evolved to work, yes. Okay. All right, so now we get into a problem, okay? So here's an existential concept, right? If we don't act, it amplifies our distress, yeah. okay? So here's the same thing. Here's the danger. We're all getting all riled up now. The nervous system's all cranking along like crazy, okay? Our breathing rate's increasing, but we're not producing the excess carbon dioxide because we're not running for our lives. Okay, so this is more in the context of a panic attack. Yeah. So if you've got a really heightened state of distress, hardly any of my patients that I work with would actually be moving they're all like maybe yeah. they're pacing but yeah. that's not at a high enough intensity yeah. to be discharged and often they're told not to pace sit down calm down yeah yeah so right? they're just sitting which is like the wrong thing right <laughs> freaking out yeah so because of the hyperventilate exactly like say you can uh, a lot of people will um pant <laughs> this kind of thing or some people will gasp <laughs> all right but whatever they're doing they're blowing off tons of yeah. this carbon dioxide yeah. and they're yeah. ending up in this state so if you're fearful to begin with now you're panicked yes okay if you're angered to begin with now you're enraged. Yeah. Or if you're sad, now you're despairing. Yeah, and this is what we talked about with distress cycle. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So going back to that previous talk. So that's our state of distress. distress. So we've got low CO2. We can't think straight. So we're sitting there freaking out. And that can go on for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half yeah. an hour. And it's Super the, unpleasant. And the reason why it's problematic is because there's a lack of action. We're not fighting or flighting in the way that we're supposed to be yeah. doing but our fight or flight has been activated. Nature is compelling us yes. to act and we're not acting. Okay, and that's why there's a problem. Yes, okay. So, so here we are. Yep. We're distressed. Yep. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to safely restore the blood carbon dioxide, normalise it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're, you know, we're not happy necessarily, but we're not as freak. we're not this, we're not freaking out. Yeah. Okay, so this situation obviously there's a lot of arousal going on in the nervous system, but a big factor is we've blown off all this carbon dioxide. It's changed the chemistry of our blood. Now we can't think straight. The emotion's exaggerated. So we need to put the carbon dioxide back somehow. Yeah. Okay, so that's the next, that's the central concept six. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, we could slow our breathing down. Okay, if you slow our breathing down, what that does is your body is producing carbon dioxide all the time. Hmm. All right. If you slow the breathing down, you're not hyperventilating, you're not eliminating all that carbon dioxide, so it can creep back up. Okay. Okay. And not quick though. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's not yeah. quick. Yeah. Okay. It takes a while. The other thing we could do is we could do some burst physical activity. 
So basically, you just do the action that your body is kind of begging you for. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Look, if you're if you're fearful, run. Okay, yeah. and that could be running up and downstairs because that's kind of convenient if you're in a building. It could be if you're at home, a skipping rope. Whatever. Yeah, but run, run as in exercise, not run away from the cockroach that you're avoiding from our previous thank you. talk. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it is. That's exactly right. It's do some burst physical activity. Yes. Okay. So in fear, running feels good. Okay. In anger, attacking feels good. So yeah, punching right. bag might be good, or weights, or something that requires a lot of upper body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Upper body feels good in fight. Lower body feels good in flight. I like that. Yeah, I just came up with that then. That was gold. <laughs> well done. All right, cool. So, so, uh, so our muscles are very busy now. They're making all this carbon dioxide for us. Okay. So what we've done there is we've discharged the emotion yep. by running or whatever. Okay. And we've normalized our blood carbon dioxide so we can become quite calm. Yeah. Quick as that. As quick yeah. as that. Like this can take as quick as 30 seconds. Whatever would make you huff and puff, bang. Yeah. The minute you'd be huffing and puffing, you, you've normalized the CO2. All right. Okay, so we've done the CO2 bit. Okay. Okay, so remember there were three bubbles at the start. Yeah. We've done the CO2. The next bit is the nervous system bit, okay? Particularly, this is how to put the brakes on the nervous system. Yes. Okay, so we talked about the sympathetic nervous system dials it up. Yes. So there's something called the vagal nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system, that winds it down. Yes. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's, I won't get too, too deep into it, but it's a funny nerve. It sort of goes everywhere. Well, vagal is Latin for wandering. It is, yeah. yeah. Vagrant. Va yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. A vagrant. Yeah. Okay. It's, okay, yes. All right. So, so notably it goes to the lungs, and that reduces the, or the, the musculature of the lungs. So that reduces the breathing rate. Yeah. It goes to the heart, that reduces the heart rate, and it goes to the adrenal glands too and reduces adrenaline production. Yes. So that's perfect, right? If you're freaking out, you want to activate your, your vagal nerve. Yes, because right? it'll drop everything. Calms your nervous system, and it means you can reaccumulate the carbon dioxide. Yes. All right, so here's our threat. Uh-oh, we're really activated. We reduce our activation by activating the vagal nerve and it normalizes our CO2. Yeah, so as sympathetic nervous system brings everything up, parasympathetic nervous system can then bring it all back yeah. down again. I yeah. remember it as parasympathetic, paramedic, they come to help. That's okay. how I remember it. Okay, nice, nice. All right, so how do we activate this calming vagal nerve? So there's so there's all kinds of ways to do it. We're going to talk about this one in detail a bit later, but we want to essentially activate something called the mammalian dive reflex. So water immersion, especially cold water immersion, is very mm -hmm. good at that. Or we can stimulate the nerve directly by applying pressure to our organs, like when you uh, tighten Tense your and bear down. Yeah. Yep. Inversion, which is, you know, those inversion things that people do. Those inversion tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, yes. there's that. Apparently yes. that'll do it. Um, but even having your legs up the wall, like lying on the ground with your legs up the wall At will a do it to degree some degree. Angle. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. There's parts of the vagal nerve that you can access and massage. They reckon humming, laughter and gargling does. Yeah, because it actually goes around the larynx before it goes to the lung. It does. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. okay. And you can get vagal nerve stimulator devices. So there are some that, there's one that looks a bit like a taser, okay, that you put on where the vagal nerve is in the neck and you kind of zap it. Yeah, let's not right. recommend that yeah. without super. No, I've got, I've got some patients that have those. Um, okay. They're not super effective. You can get implantable ones too. Or this thing called the tip technique, which is what we recommend. And we're going to talk yes. about that a little bit later in on. In our next lesson. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's the vagal nerve. What else? Meds. Yes. Okay, so, so look, meds can block this distress process. So here's the process again. There's danger, we, we, we you know, make a snap judgment about what the danger is, activates the nervous system, gets our breathing going, we're feeling overwhelmed and now we're distressed. Yes. Okay. All right, so medications like the so-called um, antidepressants, okay, what they'll do is they actually reduce sensitivity. Yes. Okay, so they can dampen down this process. That's why people with panic disorder and anxiety often do better, for a while at least, when they're on these medications, okay. You can reduce the nervous system stuff with sedatives like benzodiazepines or anticonvulsants. They'll reduce, essentially, they reduce the nerve communication signal. Okay. Yeah. But it's pretty, you know, like be, essentially you're being on something sedating the whole time, just so in case you get distressed. Okay. So not not great. There's a kind of medication called beta blockers. What they do is they block the effect of adrenaline on these organs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the public. People who need to do public speaking and are, and are not very good at it or very um, anxious about it will often do this because it doesn't slow down your thinking, it just slows down the anxiety response. Mm, we are not on beta blockers today. No. Not today, not today. <laughs> um, yeah, but if you do get to a point of overwhelm or distress, then sedation is basically what, what people would, would suggest. 
unfortunately would suggest so, you know, things like Valium and benzodiazepines and antihistamines, which includes all the antipsychotics that are commonly used for sedation these days. Okay? But I suppose the message for, for you guys, as much as, I mean, you're a psychiatrist, you have a script pad. These and I, but I hate prescribing yeah, these you, things. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's the point I was going to get to yeah. of our philosophy is skills before pills, right? Yeah. But typically, if you go to a GP or you go to a psychiatrist, you're saying, Doc, I'm having panic attack all the time. Be, okay, well, if you have a panic attack, take one of these pills and it, it'll yeah. get rid of it for you. But I suppose, and we'll get to this when we talk about the skills, is how long does it take for Valium to kick in? 20 minutes to half an hour. Yeah. So if you've done burst exercise, Two you can minutes. resolve it. Well, even even quicker, 30 seconds if you're yeah. you know, doing burpees or something, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so all these things take a while to kick in. Okay. And all of these things have negative side effects over yeah. time that build up that mean that they, the effectiveness is reduced over time. Well, exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry, here's a slide yeah, you so prepared next, earlier. So that's the next concept. Yeah, so the, you're, the longer you take this stuff, the less effective it is. Yes. Okay. So then you, end up, then you can end up potentially in a situation where you're getting panicky or distressed or whatever, and you're taking the meds, and the meds are not working. Yeah, because you'll hit a ceiling effect where yeah. your dose can only go so high, and you can't take more than that, but at that ceiling. Yeah, I've working. encountered patients on crazy doses, yeah. crazy doses of stuff. Um, and it's just, they're used to the meds, okay? So when they're freaking out now, like they're taking dangerous doses. Yeah, and it, I suppose it's that philosophy of, oh, I, I don't have time to deal with this. I need a quick fix. Yeah. Well, Valium isn't a quick fix if Valium is 20 minutes. An ice pack is a quick fix because an ice pack is 20 seconds. Yeah, that's or a, part of the tip We'll teach you that in a minute. Yeah. Or the burpees or the pause breathing that we do, those things, their skills less than two minutes, yep. you reach for your pill packet, you take it, you gotta wait for it to kick in, 20 minutes. Or yep. if you take it and the second you take it, you go, oh, thank God, that feels so much better, placebo. Absolute <laughs> placebo <laughs> yeah, effect. If you feel yeah. immediate effect, that's not the drugs, yeah. that's your head telling you, I'm gonna be okay now because I've, I've got the meds, the meds will do this for me. Yeah, yeah, well, people people can be distressed about their distress. Yes. Okay, so, so knowing that, oh, I'm gonna be okay, takes down some degree of the distress. Whereas if you had a skill, it's like, okay, it's time to apply the skill. You'll get that same, oh, I'm going to be okay yeah. because I know I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, now is that? There we go. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so this is just the point, okay? So pros and cons of using, um, PRN means as needed. It's the, the medications yeah. that you use when, you, when you're kind of, you know, stuck. Um, the pro is they're quick-ish. Ish. Ish, okay. They do the work for you. Yeah, the the... The pro of using skills is you get better and better as you do it, okay? And they're gonna be faster in effect once you get good at it. Yeah. Okay, cons. Well, you potentially get dependent on the medication, but certainly you get tolerant to the medication if you're using it regularly. You lose your confidence in yourself at managing. You, oh, it's the pills that manage it. I need me. my pills, I can't go anywhere yeah. without my pills. Yeah, so, and, and you literally miss the opportunity to, 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 be, to develop your bravery and courage. Yeah. And you stay fearful, okay? Uh, cons of skills, well, they take time until you practice them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh. Thank you for joining us for this lesson. Join us next one for lesson four when we get into the skills for how to manage a crisis.